Hello, and welcome to the Boston Herald podcast. My name is Harold Lapidus, and today's guest is one of my favorite Dylanologists, Harrison Hewitt. I first, I, I first became aware of someone identified as Harry Hugh in early April of last year after he posted an excellent piece exploring one Bob Dylan song and what it meant to him. It was titled Desolation Row and the Force of Reality. Uh, soon we were following each other on Twitter, communicating almost daily in anticipation of the upcoming World of Bob Dylan Symposium a few months later. Uh, Harry almost didn't make it, but through some stroke of luck, ended up being one of the lucky uh, 500 attendees. So uh, after landing in Tulsa, while waiting for the hotel shuttle, I struck up a conversation with the first person I saw wearing a Bob Dylan t-shirt, and his name was, uh, and is, J. Matthew Martin. I was talking to him about this guy from Canada who was attempting to attend the symposium, uh, but it was sold out by the time he finally decided he wanted to go. Then a voice from behind me, or technically in front of me since I was facing backwards, said, Harold, is that you? And of course it was Harry. And we got along right away and spent a lot of time talking about all sorts of stuff uh, whenever we had the opportunity. We've uh, kept in touch virtually ever since. And I'm repeatedly amazed by his passion and attention to detail, not to mention his sense of humor, unique outlook, and appreciation of Bob Dylan in the much maligned 1987 movie, Hearts of Fire, partially filmed in Toronto and Hamilton in Canada, and which we will delve into later. So uh, let me introduce you to Mr. Harrison Hewitt. Hi, Harry. Good to be here. Yeah, it's great to see you again and speak with you again. Uh, uh, well, first of all, how are you coping with all this uh, COVID-19 stuff and masks and social distancing and all that stuff? I mean, I'm a little ashamed to admit it hasn't required uh, uh, too much of an adjustment to my lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were social distancing before it was cool. <laughs> I was ahead of my time, like Dylan, a pioneer. <laughs> Everyone's catching up to you. Um, so uh, as I just said, um, uh, we were communicating through Twitter uh, before the symposium, and it didn't seem like you had a ticket or able to go. So um, uh, how'd you end up going, getting a ticket, or is it that interesting? I don't really remember, to be honest. You know, that was such a that was such a beautiful introduction. It was more than I was expecting. I was <laughs> I was almost waiting for Columbia recording artist. <laughs> no, I think I just. Uh, Threw a little pity party there on Twitter and somebody helped me out. I can't remember exactly what happened, but uh, I think it was, uh, I mean, Sean Latham was very gracious and generous just generally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a great guy. It was nice meeting him. Um, and so uh, are you originally from Canada? Oh, yeah. And so, um, uh, so you're also clearly an uh, admirer of a uh, fellow Canadians, uh, Leonard Cohen, Joni Mitchell, four fifths of the band. Um, and the that? fifth fifth of the band, the fifth fifth too. Honorary yeah. Canadian. The honorary Canadian transplant. Exactly. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things, if you follow Harry on uh, Twitter right now, at Harry Hugh, H A R R Y H W, he's having a 21 day salute to uh, Leonard Cohen uh, in, in uh, uh, celebration of the anniversary of his birth. And they're fascinating clips. Uh, I don't think I've seen any of them. They were just, um, uh, they're, almost always humorous and if not they're very uh droll or interesting or like, well, i appreciate i appreciate that but lest anybody think it's it's too grand of an endeavor i believe today's installment was a 25 second clip of leonard cohen singing the banana song yes which was awesome that's, that's <laughs> indication of the profundity of the project <laughs> it also gives it gives an insight into you and your uh, sense of humor and your your uh, your view of the world and everything which is uh, one of the things i appreciate well that was part of the uh i mean i don't want to speak a bit in too lofty uh, terms you know to <laughs> sending tweets out to 10 or 12 people but but the the i mean to the extent that there was ambition involved my intent was to kind of push back against the the perception of Leonard Cohen before it kind of becomes fixed in place, you know, like, I mean, to the extent that people even know about Leonard Cohen, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of people don't have no idea who he is, but to the extent people know about him, it's typically either the kind of uh, sad, sensitive person singing solemn songs in the 1960s or this uh, avunc, well, not even avuncular, like grandfatherly sage, you know, in his 70s. And there's a lot yes. in between there that's fascinating. You know, I'm a huge fan of that stuff. You know, the late 70s output, uh, 
you know, uh, Death of a Ladies Man, recent songs. I mean, those are uh, uh, various positions, which was the song, uh, I mean, Hallelujah was on various positions, wasn't even released in the United States, that record. So there's a lot there that's kind of, you know, alighted in the discussion to the, you know. so that was kind of the goal. And of course, there's the, the um, there's quite a uh, connection between uh, Leonard Cohen and Bob Dylan. Sure. I mean, I think everybody, well, I mean, when I, when I say everybody, <laughs> or, or it's, it's some famous story, it's famous within our... Right. <laughs> the ones who suffer from this particular affliction. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think people, uh, people of our ilk are familiar with the, with the story. Cohen was one of Cohen's, you know, go-to anecdotes in the repertoire was the story about having lunch with Dylan at the cafe in, in Paris and, how, you know, how long did, Dylan was a fan of Hallelujah, how long did it take you to write that song? And Cohen says, you know, um, you know, four years when it was really, you know, five or six years. And the, how long did it take you to write I and I? Dylan says 15 minutes. Yeah. And, um, uh, and right, and he, he um, was, uh, Dylan, of course, was one of the first people to uh, uh, cover uh, Hallelujah. And uh, well, he was the first, I mean, the first of any, of any note, the first that Cohen notice and he never forgot that fact either i mean he would mention it he'd always bring that up in interviews that you know uh i mean i think it was after it was used in uh in uh the, in watchman mm -hmm. cohen said you know it's probably time there was a moratorium on hallelujah covers but he was always sure to point out like when nobody paid any attention to this song you know bob Dylan, it actually is an there's an interesting story and it's and um uh, for all the attention paid to hallelujah all that's been written about it and there's a there's a aspect of that story that i find interesting that nobody's really picked up on and cohen spoke about that when the record first came out when it first came out in canada i guess or europe i mean as i say it didn't come out in the united states but mm -hmm. he talked about how he kind of leaned on dylan's voice in that song like there are lines in that song that were kind of written in Bob Dylan's voice. And when you hear Dylan sing that song, it's almost like whether they discussed that when they had that meeting or not, you can kind of see Dylan lean into those lines. Like he almost intuited that that's probably what drew him to the song. That it's, you know. Right. And, right. He's, and he's, the, he's the only one who really got that too. When you hear that, he really understood the, the, the tone of that song, the kind of defiant, uh, bitter angle to it. Whereas most people kind of just sing it as this, you know, treat it like a precious flower, you know? Yeah. Um, all right, so one of the other things um, you wanted to talk about uh, that you brought up was uh, you wanted to do, and you said, we must do this, is to uh, compare Ronaldo and Clara to the uh, Martin Scorsese film. Well, somebody has to do it. <laughs> you know, I'm waiting you're here. You're compelled. <laughs> well, I guess that person is you and, and me, so you go first. I mean, my impulse always is if, if there's something, if there's something I'm thinking or I want to say, I look around to see if anybody else is saying it. And if somebody else is, that's great. You know, I have a bowl of fruit loops, I go back to bed. But every so often, there's something that needs to be said, nobody else is saying it. So, mm. you know, I have to take it upon myself. But, uh, but what, before we get into that, or before I give my side of that uh, argument, I don't want to contaminate you with my feelings beforehand. Uh -huh. What, what did you think of, uh, I mean, what are your, what's your bite-sized uh, 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 synopsis of uh, Ronaldo and Clara vis-a-vis -vis Rolling Thunder Review of Bob Dylan's Story by Martin Scorsese? Um, well, the thing about the Scorsese film, which became obvious after I saw it and realized it was, uh, there was much of it was fictionalized, like much of Dylan's story, is that it was about the time of a reconciliation with his wife when it didn't last very long. So they couldn't really have a very truthful documentary about what was going on because he's private. She's, she's even more private than he is, uh, Sarah. And um, really remarkably, remarkably private when you think about it, when you think about how many people have tried to make contact with her. Right. Yeah. It's something to admire. Yeah. It's um, that she's uh uh, not going to communicate with anybody because um, it's private. You know, it's probably one of the things that, it, well, I don't want to say anything, but it could be one, one of the reasons that he was attracted to her and trying to think what Bob, trying to interpret what Bob Dylan's thinking is always a dangerous thing to do. But um, uh, so 
um, I didn't really know much about anything before I saw it. Um, someone just said there was a gimmick. And after I saw it, I started reading online and, you know, someone just seemed weird, but I just let it flow over me. <clears throat> and then, uh, and I started reading how this person's fake and the, the interviewer's fake and everything's fake. And, um, and then I thought, on one hand, of course, it would have been really cool to have a straightforward documentary about the Rolling Thunder Review. The other hand, it's like, wow, <laughs> it just, it's like to, to do that and to totally fool me or, uh, and fool everybody into thinking this is some sort of reality uh, was a really bold artistic move from Scorsese to do this. And but the other hand, then you have people who are really uh, involved, like a uh, Rob Stoner in particular, who had so much to do with what the Rolling Thunder sound and he's, he's not hardly in the movie, you know, you can hardly see him. And, um, and the only, uh, one of the good things about that, it, he is doing, uh, he is sticking up for himself and he is saying all these things, not in the movie, but, uh, on social media about, uh, the things that he did accomplish, which, um, I did, a lot of it, I didn't know. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I mean, my, just a, I noticed you didn't talk about Ronaldo and Claire in there. You leave oh. that up. <laughs> but, but I mean, what I would say is that Ronaldo and Clara is a strange movie, but it's mm -hmm. authentically strange. A Bob Dylan story is self-consciously strange. It's a strange movie made, strange movie made mm -hmm. by and for people who aren't strange. And as a strange person, I resent that. Like, you know, <laughs> it's a while, but don't hedge. Right. And I, I mean, I feel like I'm I had, like a little out of turn. Like, like who the heck am I to criticize? You know, Mark Scorsese film. Yeah, I mean, I mean, first of all, I mean, I guess I should preface it by saying, you know, may God eternally bless them for restoring all that footage. I mean, that was. I mean, I can't imagine the work that went into that, and it turned out terrific and uh, you know they're all terrific for doing that but mm -hmm. in terms of uh in terms of the nuts and bolts of the movie i mean it's like you were saying like philosophically i have no issue with scorsese's melding of fact and fiction like i'm i'm like you i presume i'm bewildered by those who seem aggrieved by the inclusion of fictional elements in a film about bob dylan my objection is i just think those bits are boring does a fine job of confabulating a story about seduction, but I just don't see what it adds to the story that's meaningful. And and there's an opportunity cost to that too, which you alluded to. And the relationship of women to the Rolling Thunder Review is fascinating, and it goes almost entirely un unexplored in a Bob Dylan story. You know, in think about this. In 1975, Bob Dylan sets out, he makes a film based around himself, his wife, and the woman he ditched to be with her, who also happens to be the woman with whom he's most closely associated with in the public consciousness. I, I get that he might not have been keen to do it, but Jiminy Christmas, that's not an avenue worth exploring. <laughs> it's, it's a woman who had no relationship to the tour. Mm. It's, it's just easy dodge, and those scenes, those scenes are unsatisfying, and, and, and they, don't, they don't add anything, in my opinion. You, you know, you've got Scarlett Rivera, you know, give me more of her, for God's sakes, give me more of Joni Mitchell, give me more of Joan Baez, give me more of the marvelously talented women who are actually a part of the tour, whose contributions, you know, have for decades been discounted or unjustly discounted, I would say. And the Van, Van Thorpe business, I find to be similarly dull. Like Martin Von Hasselberg, like Sharon Stone does a fine job filling his role, but there's, there's nothing in that character that I find intriguing like the making of Ronaldo and Claire is a million times more interesting than the making of this phony film Scorsese chose to stick in its place you know he, like Joan Baez wrote in her memoir and she said this repeatedly in, her, in interviews that she finds Ronaldo and Claire to be a turgid incomprehensible mess you know probably speaking for <laughs> giving vo giving a, a voice to the public in that respect I suppose you know mm -hmm. she's, she's like I, I don't agree but I love her for saying that and mm -hmm. here's an idea say that in the film 
you know, and then <laughs> ask Bob Dylan to respond. Like not a, you know, he said, she said, like it set up a conflict, but I'm genuinely, I'd be generally interested to see how Dylan would respond to that. Would he say, you know, in hindsight, yeah, she, maybe she had a point or would he defend it? I mean, it, that to me would be interesting. I mean, maybe, maybe you and I are the minority in that respect, but, but you know, I, I guess that would involve making Bob Dylan momentarily uncomfortable on camera and maybe nobody wants, you know, nobody works with him is willing to do that or wants to do that. But, but yeah, it amuses me that some folks have said they thought a, a Bob Dylan story was too weird. My view is the exact opposite, you know, <laughs> unlike Hunter S. Thompson, it never got weird enough for me. <laughs> Have 2019 uh, Bob Dylan dress up like 1975 Bob Dylan and plop him in the old footage. Bob Dylan <laughs> voice over scenes from Ronaldo and Claire and improvise new dialogue. You had a lot, you know. <laughs> I mean, they did a little bit like that. I mean, they had to alter some of the original footage to, you know, have Dylan talking about Van Thorpe and... Right, right. It's not like they, it's not like it's a plot that didn't occur to them. And I will say, I agree with you. I, I, I will admit that I was one of those people rankled by the exclusion of uh, Howard Alk and Paul Goldsmith and... Uh, uh, Jacques Levy. I mean, as I said, or as you said, and I think as I said, you know, Scorsese is perfectly entitled to tell the story in whatever way he sees fit. But I also think there's a basic level of courtesy mm -hmm. to tell the story in the first place by capturing the footage around which the whole, you know, the film is constructed. I mean, the fact that because of a Bob Dylan story, there are more people who know the name Van Thorpe than we'll ever know the name Howard Alk. I mean, that's lame. It's just lame. I mean, yes. Like, how hard would it be to say, you know, Van Thorpe got so fed up with Dylan, he walked off for a couple of weeks and was replaced by a, br a brilliant young filmmaker named Howard Alk who shot so much great stuff that uh, Van Thorpe got jealous, scrambled back to take the reins. Not that hard. It's not that hard. <laughs> How do you really feel, Harry? <laughs> oh, don't get me started on this, man. I got no. I, I mean, and, I mean, I guess I, I suppose my disappointment stems from the fact that while waiting for the Scorsese film, I found mm -hmm. myself reading and listening to a lot of interviews Dylan did around the time of the release of Ronaldo and Claire, and I think taken together, they reveal more about Dylan than, you know, any interviews he gave before or since, or any he's given since. And, and, and again and again, he comes across in these conversations as someone who is desperately trying to get out from under himself. I, you know, like, I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, it's just a short walk from there, you know, to personal turmoil. And, you know, a year later, he throws himself into the hands of the Lord. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm very much of the belief that Dylan left a trail with Ronaldo and Clara, which he's kind of been trying to cover up since. And for whatever reason, you know, uh, you know, a lot of Dylan, Dylan, what are we, Dylanologists? <laughs> Dylanologists have been uninterested in following that trail. And, and you know, like most people treat Ronaldo and Claire as if it was subordinate to the Rolling Thunder Review, when, as you know, that formation is inside out. And uh, I was looking forward to seeing Dylan re-enter this room, which has been locked for 40 years. And instead, you know, he and Scorsese decided to tell us the room was bare. And I just think that's baloney. And by sanctioning a do-over of Ronaldo and Claire, it, it, Dylan has seemingly acceded to the critical consensus that it was a misfire, and that breaks my heart because I don't feel it was. And another thing, one, one last thing, like if you listen to those interviews, he's talking about when they ask him about uh, embarking upon this new career as a filmmaker, he's talking about films plural. Like he had, it, I think it's in, in the, uh, one of the Jonathan Codd interviews where he's talking uh, explicitly about what he's going to do on it in his next film and the film after that what themes he wanted to explore so that whole avenue was was closed uh by the you know the critical reaction to Ronaldo and Claire and I, you know I don't know if Dylan would ever admit it but obviously it made an impact on him because he's basically abandoned that uh that whole trail yeah I mean if a guy went a different way I mean he'd be making his own music videos he'd be making I mean, he could he, he could be doing a lot of fascinating things, but he just seems to have banded that whole thing. That whole. I mean, did you read the article, the, the piece that Jacques Levy's uh, son wrote, Julian? I read it at the time. You might have to remind me. Uh, well, it's I mean, aside of the fact that how he, he was uh, left out of the whole story. Yeah, so they, they invite him and his mother 
to see, uh, you know, to, I don't know if it was a premiere or private screening or, or what have you. And, you know, I don't think they've told them what to expect, but you get an invitation. I think you're, you know, you would take as implication that my father might be, who, who is like the director of this tour might be, you know, a part of this movie. And can you imagine going to that? You're bringing your mom, you're sitting there looking up on the screen, waiting for your dad, waiting for your dad, waiting for your dad. And, I mean, come on. Is it, yeah. You know, yeah, that is something that, uh, yeah, is, um, but on, on the other hand, and I'm not saying, and I, we, had, we had private discussions about other things that, um, but the thing is by not addressing Jack Levy and not addressing uh, Howard Alk, not addressing Rob Stoner, we're talking about them more <laughs> than uh, if they were just in the film, right? People are, Dylanologists, and I'm not saying this is a good thing or anything, and I'm a passing judgment, but okay, so this is what we're handed. It's this weird, as you said, contrived, weird film, leaving out so much of the truth. So here we are discussing it, and here we are talking about what it should be. Like, yeah, we are, but we knew the name Howard Oak beforehand. You know, the people who didn't know that name going in still don't know that name. Right now, they they know uh, they know Van Thorpe and they know uh, <laughs> and Thorpe. <laughs> they they know Sharon Stone's the, the critical role she played in this. Right. <laughs> they don't know. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean. There's no as I say. They're they're entitled to tell the story any way they want. I just think it's kind of lame that yeah. they that, that particular aspect that they. Uh, and now, now you have to go. <laughs> They have to go to Tulsa and get an appointment and post COVID and get a special pass if you're cool enough to to research yourself, but you want Rolling Thunder to. Yes, and that, but one thing I will say is that I do hope there is a physical release because, you know, think about all that footage they restored. Yeah. I mean, you know, back, know, in, the days, back in the days of, uh, of DVDs, you know, you get that be loaded with special features and, you know, and so. I think I think there is I I think there is uh, some movement in that direction. I well, someone yeah, yeah, someone mentioned something about Criterion, but I know I don't know who that person was, and I don't know if Criterion knows Netflix, anything about. Netflix normally like their standard policy is, you know, not to uh, so a physical not copy. To, yeah. Yeah, because it, it cannibalizes the. But I, but the Scorsese is such, you know, I assume he could have got a carve out or got any deal he wanted because of it who he is so. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, and uh, speaking of which, so um, uh, as far as a recent product, before we get into another Dylan movie, is um, uh, Rough and Rowdy Ways, uh, and not to mention about seventy-five discs of archival stuff that's come out lately. Um, but let's focus on uh, Rough and Rowdy Ways. Um, I assume you liked it. <laughs> oh, you're throwing it on me. Okay, well, I'll go first. Uh, you know, this is one of those areas where I'm generally, like, I'm generally reticent to, to, to offer opinions on this sort of thing because there's so many people smarter than me who've already said, you know, things about this record that are smarter than anything I could I, I, I could offer, you know, I did, that's, that's why I like to, uh, that's why I like to, to hit upon things people haven't touched. There's less competition, you know? <laughs> I mean, what can you say? I mean, it's a great record. I mean, the, 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 the unfortunate thing about being a Dylan fan is that you can't just leave it at that, right? Because if you say mm -hmm. this is a great record, inevitably the question that falls on, you know, on the, falls from that is, well, is it as great as blank record, you know? Right, right. X, so... You know, I mean, is it as good as Blood in the Tracks? Is it as good as Time Out of Mind? I mean, you know, how am I, how am I supposed to <laughs> make those determinations? I mean, my thing is, when I'm listening to a record, I don't exist in this comparative state where I'm listening to Key West and I'm going, boy, gee, this is good, but let me pause this. Is this as good as Idiot Wind? Is this as good as, <laughs> you know... Uh, yeah, I just remember, like, 20 years ago, I read Eric Clapton said something, and they asked him, what's his favorite blues record or guitarist or something? And he just said, I can't look at music like that. And I found it very liberating. So ever since then, I haven't, you know, it to me, it's Dylan's, the arc of his career. It's like, well, what's he doing next? And, and how is it compared to other things just in terms of 
the influence that it had. Like what did the Frank Sinatra standards album have to do with, did it have an effect on this album? Why did it even do that? That type of thing. But uh, whether something is better or worse, I mean, there's someone who's always going to have a different opinion. Like I think Sgt. Pepper is better than Revolver and you can't make me change my mind about that. I mean, <laughs> I mean, in all honesty, I'm kind of at war within myself because my natural instinct, you know, as a, as a, uh, uh, obsessive compulsive is to lean into lists and rankings and <laughs> you know where does this compare to next one but uh, you know you see all these lists of top 500 bob dylan songs and i said one time i want to do a list of the top 500 bob dylan lists <laughs> exactly I mean, how's you know it's just i mean it's just i mean what is, what do those things exist for other than to get people upset you know yeah it was like there's. I just read this thing the other day. It, I, I don't think I read it very closely because I got the the gist of it. But it was like a, a negative review of Rough and Rowdy Ways, and the point was, well, compare it to Mr. Tambourine Man and do this, and then, you know all these old fogies who still listen to Bob Dylan, blah blah blah. And his, his in his own world, the the person who wrote this, it makes sense, but his premise is wrong because it's not like comparing it to anything else, like we just said, but it, you take it on its own terms and just it, it's just unlike anything I've ever heard in a lot of ways. And, well, I think uh, Dylan, uh, I mean, Dylan's expressed that same frustration, like compare me to what else is out there now. Don't compare me to myself, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, <laughs> 55 years ago. <laughs> Actually, one interesting thing that, that ties into, we were talking about Leonard Cohen earlier is, is, and speaking of Dylan interviews, is I love that the 2016 profile of Leonard Cohen, the New Yorker profile of David Remnick, mm -hmm. Dylan uh, supplied uh, an ample uh, number of, of, of complimentary quotes. I love that. And there's, uh, there's a songwriter and a journalist, uh, Elizabeth Nelson, who, who said that, you know, if you take that and you combine it with all the things Dylan said about different artists in Chronicles, and I would add to that his liner notes for World Gone Wrong. He might be, Bob Dylan might be our greatest living critic. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to hear Bob Dylan review Bob Dylan records. That um, yeah, that would, well, that would be something. <laughs> I mean, I, one part of that is, I, I, I've said, um, you know, my advice to anybody looking for a great description or analysis or summary of Bob Dylan is to look up some of the things Dylan has said about other artists because you know having internalized a uh, altogether unhealthy number of <laughs> Bob Dylan interviews over the years I'm continually struck by how the complimentary things he says about other people are almost well I don't want to say almost always but very often things that could also be said about himself mm -hmm. right so like I wrote down a couple of these things this, so here's some quotes uh, Dylan supplied for the 2016 New Yorker profile of Leonard Cohen, okay? Mm -hmm. When people talk about Leonard, let me get these here. When people talk about Leonard, they fail to mention his melodies, which to me, along with his lyrics, are his greatest genius. His gift or genius is in his connection to the music of the spheres. And then there's a long um, analysis of Sisters of Mercy, which concludes, this is a, it has a deceptively unusual musical theme with or without lyrics. It's so subtle a listener doesn't realize he's being taken on a musical journey and dropped off somewhere. Here's another one. I like all of Leonard's songs earlier late. You see where I'm going with this? <laughs> I like some of his later songs even better than his early ones. That, I would submit, ladies and gentlemen, is Bob Dylan defending Bob Dylan as much as it is Bob Dylan celebrating Leonard Cohen. And it, it, it you know, not to say, uh, you know, there's no question that every one of those quotes applies to Leonard Cohen. I'm not suggesting Dylan is being disingenuous, but if you right. read it, you'll see he does this sort of thing all the time. Rather than compliment himself directly, he'll ascribe to other people, other artists, traits that he himself possesses. Then he'll compliment those people on the basis of those traits. And similarly, when he rises to a particular artist's defense, you'll find he, he, he often defends that person against charges that were previously levied against him. So that way he can hit back against his critics without betraying any insecurity. It's, it's really quite clever. Um, so that, brought, that just brought to mind two things and hopefully I can remember them long enough to, to get to both of them. One was my understanding, um, uh, if you remember it was like 2003 or so, they started reissuing Dylan uh, CDs. They, they upgraded the sound and some were SACD. Um, now, my, what I heard originally is that Dylan was going to write liner notes for all these things. And uh, that didn't happen. 
Uh, and But when he handed in Chronicles, the initial version, and again, I have no, this is stuff I heard before the internet. I don't know, you know, I can't, I have no, I didn't It doesn't know. leave this room, don't worry. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, when he finished the three chapters about the early days of uh, being in the village and all that, the next two uh, chapters that he, I assume he, uh, submitted was probably what he was working on for Oh Mercy and New Morning as that they were going to be liner notes for that book. So that would be, I mean, for the uh, liner notes. So he submitted them for the book because probably he didn't want to write, <laughs> didn't want to write anymore. And uh, just, it was just easier just to hand in that. And the other thing that it came to mind was, uh, did you hear, did you ever hear um, Dylan's uh, music hair speech? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite things. I said before Rough and Ratty Ways came out, I said music here is, was probably my favorite thing, Dylan, that speech, I mean, it was probably my favorite thing Dylan's done this decade or last decade, whatever. This century, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because the things you were saying, it, it, like he was saying, talking, criticizing people, uh, the, the singer singing the Star Spangled Banner and singing every note and, that exists and every note that doesn't exist or whatever he said. And um, and say so who says I can't sing? And you know, you know, Tom. Who no one says that about Tom Waits or whatever it is. And um, so that's one of the few times I think that he he uh, well, I'm gonna, again, we have to qualify everything we say because whoever's you know people like us are watching this, and then they're gonna criticize things we say for accuracy. But um, the uh, um, uh, um, this is like a Bob Dylan fact and fiction. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bob Dylan is fiction <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> he's, a, he's this character that he invented. Sometimes I think that. I just I also wonder that, um, like you. Um, well, before we leave music here, I, I'm sure you remember the controversy. You know, like you know that 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 spread it up from that. He remember he, he issued that statement because he. You know, people were piling on him for piling on Merle Haggard. All right, yeah. Who he just and toured with right before. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I mean, I mean, you know, without getting too far into uh, spec, you know, speculation, a lot of those music care events are, I think all of them or most of them are professionally recorded and released, or they were mm -hmm. up to that point. And there was an announcement. Uh, you know, follow. You know that it was reported on in the press that there were that uh, there was an intention to release that, and then nothing ever came of it. So I wonder if that was Dylan kind of went, you know, acceding to the, uh, you know, the 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 belief of some, uh, um, you know, controversy uh, merchants that, you know, mm -hmm. he shouldn't have said such and such thing. I mean, to me, I love that stuff. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't expect Dylan to be, uh, you know, angelic. I mean, I'm as interested in him expressing, you know, vitriol or, or the unseemly parts of his personality as the, as the seemly parts of his personality. You know, I mean, I mean, people love those songs, positively forestry, like a Rolling Stone. They love it in his songs. And then, you know, when it seeps out into an interview or a speech uh, here or there, you know, all of a sudden people are, you know. How dare you? <laughs> Uh, um so uh anyway um where were well, we? So, we well we were at rough and rowdy ways a while ago and you escaped <laughs> without giving your opinion um, well i did i did write about it but um yeah i think uh and that's one of the things um and this is a a problem i, I i'm glad i have but uh uh in almost every case uh someone at the record label or someone will send me an advanced copy and some or a streaming thing where I can listen to it in advance. Nice, nice humble brag there. <laughs> but the thing is, is that so, so I'm, it's all I listen to until I, till uh, it's written. And it's, it is okay. It's like homework, you know what I mean? It's like, all right, I want to, I want to figure this out. I have to write something that hopefully no one else is going to write. Mm -hmm. And um, so, it's it's complicated because it's not like most. I mean, I think a lot of other people do it as well when they get the album, they sit down and they analyze it and so on. But for me, I have to 
hopefully come up with something that's worth reading. And um, so this one, I found it went once I um, felt like I got a handle on some of the things, it, it started to flow and then I was pretty happy with it. But um, like for instance, um, my own version of you, when I, I made it a, um, to me, it was a, a, an allegory or whatever of his songwriting where he takes some um, dead things and brings them to life. And it's not a direct thing. And if you want to analyze every line, it wouldn't make sense. But um, I thought, well, I don't know if anyone else is going to come up with that. Or, and I made a, a Monty Python uh, <laughs> uh, um, connection because he's, um, he says the Holy Grail in one song and then lop off your arm in another. And it, it just reminded me of you know, Monty Python. And does it mean to do with Monty Python? Well, let's, let's, let's pause at my own version of you for a second so I can in, in, inject my own stupid thoughts. That was one of my favorite Bob Dylan songs before I ever heard it. Just on the strength of those, like the, the lyrical excerpts that came out. And I, I, like, I'm sure you do this, well, maybe you don't, but like when you, you see the lyrics uh, uh, before you hear the music, I almost make up the song in my head. Mm -hmm. And then, so that one, I almost did it to uh, George Harrison's Got My Mind Set on You. <laughs> <laughs> so then, and I don't know. I mean, Dylan's song is better, but I still kind of like the, that uh, song I created in my head. But, but it, don't, don't you If he ever tours again, that's my, that might be the version he exactly. does. Don't you find it incredible, though, that he can write a song like that? That's an awesome song that is somehow nothing like the other, whatever, 600 awesome songs he's written? Yeah. And, um, and I think... I, that I, might be slight hyperbole to say 600 awesome songs. However many songs he's written, there's a portion of those that are awesome. 595 of them are pretty awesome. Those five, oh, those five, we know what they are. Um, uh, I, yeah, I remember... You were talking about Robot Commando on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> that's that when, I, like, that's that when I had to look my, it up. I didn't even know Robot Commando. I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> that was my contribution to the discourse. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just thought uh, um, the either the three or five uh, Sanders albums, depends how you look at it, um, of a Frank Sinatra type songs. Um, I think that helped with his vocals. I think it, they were... Um, uh, with certain nuances, especially with the um, uh, Give Myself to You song. Um, uh, and I just thought it was just so, 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 much, so much of it was the minimalist, it was very minimal sort of sounding. There's no uh, Lanois echo or anything like that. It was, very, it was just very um, straightforward. And, um, but what I thought was odd and I still think it's odd is that he mentions so many clues or, or just so yeah, everything from Stevie Nicks to you know Robot Commando <laughs> um, and just it's a, there's so many things that are references to things in the real world and some are more obscure I guess there was an obscure Warren Zevon reference well it's somehow. not even a direct Warren Zevon reference right right yeah references and via Carl Wilson like how many people know Carl Wilson was the you know like arranged the uh, 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 you know uh, Desperados under the eaves right I didn't know that and that when that's when people made that connection that's like I never would have gotten it but but so many of them are just like uh, like it's like a shopping list of so many cultural figures and events and um, and and it it kind of threw me for a loop at first because it was just so obvious. It's, it's nothing to analyze other than why is he talking about Lindsay and Stevie Nicks and, and why is he bringing up, I can't remember all the people, but there was like, just like, you know, just so many people. And then, and then radio stations would play three hour specials with all the songs that he's referencing, you know, starting with, I want to hold your hand and, you know, on, uh, you know, murder most foul and just going on and on trying to, uh, make all those references and they probably didn't even get all of them. And it was just, um, you know, it's not like he's bringing up Quasimodo or, you know, whoever he used to talk about or write about. I mean, these are like recent cultural figures that a lot of them emerged since he has become famous. And he's done it a little bit like with Alicia Keys and um, uh, yeah. Billy Joe Shaver. Whatever Neil was. Young. Yeah, Neil Young, yep. So, um, uh, Although that Billy Joe Shaver line or couplet or verse or what have you, 
I don't know if that was Dylan or uh, Robert Hunter appropriate because it kind of it, it doesn't kind of sound like Robert Hunter writing a Bob Dylan verse kind of. Um, yeah, I never. I mean, it, that could very well be. I don't know if I ever looked at it that way. I just. Um, what, what actually, what do you think of Together Through Life as an album? I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, do I have to consult my, I'll have to consult my <laughs> rankings, my, my list. <laughs> I mean, again, it, it's in your, it's in the top 50 Bob Dylan studio albums. I like it. I, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's been sort of unfairly, you know, people tend to skip over it and talk about, you know, like immediately when Rough and Rowdy Waves came out or Tempest came out, it's like, how does this compare to modern times? How does this com compare to Love and Theft? Mm -hmm. Time out of mind, they just skip right over together through life, which I think is, you know, I don't, I think that's unfair. I mean, that part of that could be that, you know, so many people who like Bob Dylan, you know, they first and foremost, love Bob Dylan, the lyricist. So anything co-written or, you know, same reason people skip over the standards albums in their, in their, you know, in the arc of their analysis. What did you think of the standards albums? Um, well, the first one I thought, like, blew me away. I just, because when I heard about it, I was like, really? <laughs> and then, um, and then I heard it and I, I got it, I, I think, I mean, like you said modestly, um, that uh, I, I, he certainly wanted to do something different. He probably want, didn't want to be Bob Dylan for a while. I think there are many days he doesn't want to be Bob Dylan. And um, I had some other theories, like he's competing. I, I, I feel totally differently. I want to be Bob Dylan every day. <laughs> every day where I don't want to be Bob Dylan. I have the opposite impulse. Um, he'll gladly hand the reins over to you, probably. <laughs> exactly. Um the Harry Hugh symposium and <laughs> exactly. um, uh, so anyway, um, but also there were other things like, um, if you remember, they were releasing the cutting edge stuff, the 1965, 66 stuff and the 66 yeah. tour box set. And if he put any new album out at the time, I think they'd said, well, it's not as good as like a Rolling Stone. It's like, a, <laughs> you know, you know, you know it's really funny like, you mentioned the cutting edge because the Cutting Edge Collector's Edition, that is the only Bob Dylan related related uh, 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 object I possess which has ever tested the the depth of my fandom. You know, once you <laughs> listen to maybe the 17th version of One of Us Must Know, you know, it's a great song, but <laughs> I don't know, how, you know, that's the one time where I'd, okay, uh, how many more of these? <laughs> <laughs> my you know perverse uh, tendency to want to plow through everything and you know yeah I, um, I, I didn't have a gun to my head i didn't have to listen to them all <laughs> back to back and back to back but you know that's the choice so those are the choices you make in life and you, you got to live with the consequences <laughs> and what about the 66 tour yeah it's the same thing or or is that different no that one i went right to <laughs> 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 the same 15 songs over and over again see that i can do <laughs> but they're spaced out you know it's like this you know more ways than one <laughs> this with 15 songs and then you listen to the next one with this 15 songs whereas cutting edge it's like you know the same oh. song 20 times in a row false start you know some of that is so heartbreaking too like like uh, it like she's your lover now when it breaks just at the end and it's like yeah. i've heard that you know a thousand times and still there's a part of me every time that's hoping he's going to pull through. <laughs> oh, finish the song, finish the song. Mm. So if I could go back in time, if I could, somebody built me a time machine or, or, or well, it's, if I built myself a time machine, why am I selling myself short? If I built myself a time machine, I went back in time, I'd kill Hitler first, I'd kill Hitler. <laughs> Columbia Studio, whatever it was, A or B, and I, and I and I say, come on, Bob, you can do it. Finish this song. We've only got a verse to go. <laughs> uh, um, all right. Well, okay. Now I want to finally talk about Hearts of Fire. You know, well, there's a jump. <laughs> and um, they just sat up straight. Um, so uh, I, I just wanted to preface it by my personal experience. I remember when it was uh, being uh, uh, announced and I think he was originally supposed to write all four songs for the movie and he ended up with uh, two. <laughs> um, and uh, 
what I got, since it wasn't even released here uh, at first, it was just uh, in British movie theaters and it tanked and it got bad reviews. And it was a time, obviously, the low point in his career and in, in, in most people, including Bob Dylan's uh, estimation. But I had a friend uh, named uh, John Tebbets who worked in some sort of publishing, uh, promotional thing, and uh, he moved to New York. And he, he sent me a VHS of an uncut version of Hearts of Fire. It's like 10 minute reels. It didn't have all the sound effects. Like if it had like a like a, a, a glass breaking or a motorcycle, like you wouldn't hear it. Did it have outtakes? Uh, well, here's the thing. I do have the VHS rotting in my basement somewhere. I don't have a VHS thing that works. Um, and I didn't, I, it didn't even get to the end. It, it was two hours long of 10 minute reels and it got to, to the point around the, it got to the point where Dylan was singing um, this Shell Silverstein song, the couple more years. And that's how it ended. So, you know, it, for decades, I didn't know how the movie ended. <laughs> and um, I, was, I was in suspense. <laughs> so yeah, all I, won't I won't spoil it for you if you have, have you seen it now? You, no, it yeah, now? I saw it. yeah, I saw it with okay. you on that. And I saw, I saw you two had it. And okay, okay. Though, um, hopefully I shouldn't say that because maybe they'll take it down. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I, I do know how it ends, although I don't know if I can actually tell you <laughs> again. I don't really remember. But I've seen it twice in the last year. And um, so, uh, it, so expecting the, first of all, when the music, that horrible eighties music comes on, I, I thought, I don't think I could do this. <laughs> with all the, the exciting remember how it was a Fiona um, with the eighties production and everything. And, um, and, but I will defend Bob Dylan's acting in that movie. I think mm. he is hilarious. What do you think? Well, you know I agree with that. <laughs> I mean... You can't I mean, take your eyes off him, first of all. What do we do with Hearts of Fire? I mean... Uh, he sucks. <laughs> it made me a better movie starring Fiona Flanagan. You can't do it. You can't do it. You know, you know the reason I asked you if it had outtakes is because I could have sworn, like, you know, eight or ten years ago, maybe longer than that, uh, I, I could have sworn I saw like five minutes worth of outtakes from Hearts of Fire. And it's one of those things, you know, this was before the era where I started, you know, saving everything, you know, every Bob Dylan video I found, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in case it was, it was, you know, slipped down the memory hole. Right. But, but I don't know what became of that. I think it, I think it was somebody on, on Expecting Rain or, but, but it's so long ago and I haven't been able to, uh, to find it, you know, that I started thinking, you know, I just, it was a hallucination, but but when you started talking about that, uh, got my uh, I'm gonna have to <laughs> dive into those waters again, see what I can come up with. Um, yeah, but there was a I should say uh, uh, to the uh, listeners, the viewers there at home, that I was disappointed not to see you. Uh, last year, uh, I organized a bus tour for the 32nd. Uh, uh, anniversary to commemorate the 32nd anniversary of Hearts of Fire. Oh yeah, that's on my list of things to ask you about. So uh, how did that, how did that bus tour, well, how did that tour well, go? I gotta say, uh, well, first, say first, first, I, but before you, you have to put in context that it, it was filmed, you know, that parts of Hearts of Fire were filmed in England and parts of it were, uh, there was filmed, were filmed in Toronto and in Hamilton. I'm not sure where Hamilton is, but. In the greater, uh, in the greater Harry Hugh area. <laughs> We, we, for the purposes of for the purposes of this story, we're we're uh, we're ignoring the uh, the uh, England parts of the movie. Okay, right, yeah, they they weren't as good anyway. Yeah. And the bus, the bus has trouble. The bus has trouble making that journey. But uh, <laughs> I must say, it was a rousing success. I was a little disappointed that uh, nobody showed up except me. But uh, it was, <laughs> well, because the bus didn't show either. <laughs> did you did uh, you invite any tour, did you invite anybody or let anyone know that it was going to happen? I made, I made the tour by foot, and and uh, what a tour it was! A great time had by all, and 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 by all I mean, of course, me. And um, you shared your uh, discoveries about what happened to the locations and how they were replaced the by other things. The and sounds of hearts and fire, yes. Um, yeah, actually, the, um, that's the only. I don't have that album. Do you have the album, Hearts of Fire? Ah, oh, you've hit upon a sore spot. <laughs> I remember I saw it once in a used record store and I didn't get it. I not say I have it, but, uh, you know, I, I want to be honest with with you and with the viewers who have uh, 
afforded us a great generosity in, in, in listening to this discussion. So no, I do not have it, but. Uh, yeah, I don't have it either. <laughs> um, I'm sure it'll show up one day for, you know, two bucks somewhere. We'll find it. I don't know when What's your will. favorite? What are, what are some of your favorite scenes in Heart? Well, I will say the only part I, I, I have trouble with in Hearts of Fire is when the blind woman uh, blows her head off. Ooh, ooh, spoiler alert. Well, oh my gosh, can we delete that? <laughs> Back up. <laughs> so, folks, folks. Well, I don't, think you, I don't think you understood the symbolism that the blind person was the only person can truly see what Rupert Everett's character really was like. Did yes, you get the heaviness he, there? It was quite I deep. The heaviness because of the, you know, she's not uh, distracted by the circus, the sideshow and the stage show. You know, she, 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 no, I'm, no, I get it, man. I get it. <laughs> I'm just saying that, that, you know, if I'm showing this, this, you know, if I say to somebody, hey, you want to watch this fun movie with Bob Dylan? I don't want someone blowing her head off in the, in, you know, in the middle of the movie. <laughs> totally, it takes us to a, a disagreeable uh, location. Yes. That was, um, it, it was a bit of a shock, especially, well, well, I guess you'll have to see oh, the film to see how it unfolds. It's a shock to all the, all the viewers out there who just heard, just heard <laughs> this horrifying news. Right, we didn't know who was going to get it, so that was the thing. <laughs> but, um... On my yeah. list, I'm just here of my five <laughs> Uh, but like every every scene with Dylan is 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 uh, I, I, what are your favorite scene five favorite scenes that don't have Bob Dylan in it? <laughs> you know, one of the interesting things about that is there was an interview with uh, Fiona Flanagan that I of course listened to, you know, because I am nothing if not a completist, mm. and I think you'll relate to this. Like a lot of times, some of the most interesting insights into Dylan come from people who are like tangential or don't understand how deep in the weeds people like you and me are, right? So they don't know what they're... So she just casually mentions that, you know, she was uh, taking uh, private uh, acting classes with Dylan. Oh, really? You can really see that. Uh, I think you'll agree in the film. It really comes out. You know, the, the, the degree to which they, they finally honed their, their acting chops. Uh, yes, I'm sure Dylan paid a lot of attention. It's like the... the um similar to the painting lessons of uh, Blood on the Tracks and how it uh, inspired that album, uh, that uh, the uh, acting lessons uh, affected uh, Dylan's um, acting in uh, Hearts of Fire. I will say, I, I feel I, an obligation to buff up my uh, Dylan uh, bona fides after I admitted that I don't own the Hearts of Fire uh, soundtrack uh, uh, vinyl. I, do, I did purchase, I'd like you to know, Rupert Everett's memoir purely to read his reflections on that on that critical uh time in his life and in all of our lives really. and um yeah if uh, well if you have well but i assume you own a copy of the movie now would you, um, i own a copy of the novelization too I <laughs> the viewers at home to know that um do you have any what are your what, what are your weirdest dylan things that you have <laughs> Besides that. <laughs> well, I feel like I set the bar pretty high on that one. I don't know if I can clear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess you peaked there already. You know, Fiona said, uh, if I can go back to this interview for a second, they asked her if, they, uh, if, she, if she'd had any uh, encounters with Dylan since. And she said she ran into him at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. You know, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame dinner or ceremony. I don't think they were just both sightseeing. But, right, right. but I, assume, I assume it was the year Dylan was Nin inducted or else. Yeah, 95 or whatever. I mean, well, was, it, was, it, was it the, um, well, it doesn't matter, because he was inducted and it was also- It does like, matter, the, let's get this straight. We, we, the viewers no, they, they don't expect accuracy from us. Well, you're, you're the one, it's your story. <laughs> uh, you, you, you remember Fiona's last name. Um, the, because uh, uh, there was the concert too in 1995 when they opened the thing. Yeah, that's Springs. what I was gonna say. So I'm not sure what it was, but- But, but we narrowed it down to two. Yeah. So, so, or they, or they just happened to both be in Ohio. Yeah, maybe so. they were just there. Who knows? But uh, or maybe I made it up. You, you know, you'll never know. Right, but, right. but Fiona says, uh, you know, she's walking around, and Dylan sees her. He goes, "Hey, uh, I'm not going to do my, I'm not going to do an impression." I feel like anytime you you deliver a Dylan quote, you have to make up your mind in advance whether you're going to do a Dylan impression or. Right. But he he said, uh, "Hey, uh, whatever happened to that movie we made?" <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
Yeah, I'll let that. I'll let that speak for itself. Yeah. Well, the thing is, too, is like, uh, let's just say, obviously, that was that along with the um, tight connection to my heart video, <laughs> are uh, um, and uh, all that. It was um, pretty much most people would agree that that was the low point in um, unless you think you went electric. Well, most that. people does not include me. I want to make that very clear. <laughs> That's right. Um, but the thing is. Um, he dug himself up from that hole. I mean, that was it. I mean, he uh, was, um, you know, you know again, you, you, quoting Dylan's almost like the worst, he's like the worst source for any, any Dylan information. But um, yeah, it's one of the things I think that was real when he felt like he was becoming an, an, an oldies act and with the, when he's playing with the dead, he was saying, what are these just a bunch of words? You know, it's just like, like he, he had lost touch with what he was doing. And he really had to build himself up again somehow. And he and um, so, if he had not done that, I don't know if, how much we'd appreciate this movie if he just went. If that was it. And then he kind of retired. We go, ooh, that was a, that was a, that, was a, that wasn't a particular um, good Although thing. The but timeline that, that is interesting in Chronicles when he talks about, yeah, it was it was uh, you know uh, touring with the dead that brought him back to life, if you if you will. <laughs> yeah, I make a new version of me <laughs> that kind of muddies the waters like i love the tom petty tour which proceeds muddies the waters good one <laughs> i didn't draw attention to that i was hoping you'd uh, pick up on that one thank you but uh, don't you also you should check out you check out harry's uh, uh black muddy water uh podcast anyway, go ahead <laughs> thank you you're, you're my biggest fan you're my only fan but, oh, come on I, like, okay. I like the tom petty, uh, that tour was that's a great tour mm -hmm. Now, now, I'm not sure how old you are, but did you, did you actually, were you, did you see any of that stuff or is that before your time? I'm an admirer from afar. But okay. I, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a slight bit, I, I mean, there's a slight bit of cheekiness uh, that's informing our discussion of Hearts of Fire, but I will say that I love Dylan's 80s output, unironically. I love mm -hmm. it. I mean, I mean, you know, if you're talking about, I mean, it's not to go through the whole litany, but just at the beginning there, I mean, if you you look at Shot of Love, you look at the outtakes from Shot of Love, okay? You bundle the outtakes from Shot of Love and put that on a record, that's one of my favorite, that, on my list of the great Bob Dylan records, that yep. is a hypothetical Bob Dylan records, that's right at the top, I mean, uh, you know. And Seth Rogovoy <laughs> agrees with you on that. I remember that when he heard the, those uh, outtakes, you know, the uh, you know Seth Rogovoy, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So oh, he, he's um, on the right side of history. But if you put up that triumvirate of, of Angelina, uh, the groom still waiting at the altar, Caribbean wind. I'll put that three song, that trilogy, up against any other three songs in the Dylan songbook. You know, when you add in, uh, uh, you know, you, you know, whatever, yonder comes sin. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you change my life. Uh, uh, magic. City I mean, of gold and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, a, it's, it's bad. That's that might be. Well, I don't want to say, I don't want to get into the greatest, but that's a great, <laughs> I'm almost breaking my own rule there. <laughs> Underappreciated Bob Dylan band, that era. Tim Drummond and all those guys. Yes. Um, borrowed time, borrowed time. Yeah, the thing is, um, we, we that's a deep cut for all the uh, folks out there. Is that the time to sign I'm not. No, I'm thinking of a different song. Anyway, borrow time. I'm with John Lennon. That's one of the cool somebody. things about yeah. those the, those studio sessions is you can hear Dylan just kind of, you know, coming up with stuff on the spot, just kind of, you know, uh, you know, piecing together lines, and the band just effortlessly, uh, you know, congregates around him and builds this sound and creates this song out of nothing, you know, right in the moment, and then it's lost to everyone except for <laughs> so the, the the magnetic tape that like captured it. Exactly. <laughs> Um, actually, I wasn't planning on asking you about these things, but um, uh, th but you're inspiring me right now. One is um, so, and then what are your thoughts on Dylan and the Dead? I mean, I, I I'm I enjoy those shows, but my point, my only point was I don't enjoy them any more or or uh, uh, less any than Hearts of Fire. Like, yeah. No, I mean I like the Petty Tour. Uh huh. You know, I like the Dead Tour. Trying to think of a tour, I'm I'm willing to disparage uh, publicly. I can't, no, <laughs> I like it all. I like it all. 
what do you think? I mean, do you see a do you see a point of demarcation between the you know Tom Petty tour, the Grateful Dead? I mean, well, here this is um, I can promote my own uh, class that I'm teaching online next month, but uh, the uh, I already taught it once, and I have even more information to add to it. But um, see, I saw Pet, Dylan and Petty, and I saw Dylan and the Dead, and um, and it, it, that yeah, that was those were the steps I think that led to him. Uh, getting, becoming uh, the Bob Dylan for the last few decades that, um, to get him out of the mid eighties, um, uh, Hearts of Fire, you know, bad video kind of um, era. And, you know, get, trying to, listening, basically, well, first of all, basically Dylan's at his best when he's focused and he does what he wants. That's fine. When he has those other people, you know, he, he tends to be, what we, it's not the actual term passive aggressive, but we think of passive aggressive. Um, there was one, um, I can't remember her name, but a, a woman he was with wrote a book and I guess the, I guess after Empire Burlesque didn't sell, he just said, I'm just gonna power records that I don't care if they're any good because they can't make me sell records or whatever it was. Um, but um, uh, so for me, the, uh, with Tom Petty it was the first step Although, you know, and I, I saw a few of those t shows, and it, when he was doing covers, he was alive and animated and really into it. When he was doing his own songs, not so much sometimes. If you see, uh, sometimes when he does Rainy Day Women, he doesn't say anything. <laughs> He's like, you're stunning, you mean, you mean, you mean. You know, Don't you then, find it interesting that, that, I think that holds across the board, that he tends to treat uh, covers with more, uh, reverence with more delicacy than he, and the, speaking specifically of the arrangements right he, he, t he tends to to not divert too far from the arrangements of of the originals like he feels like somehow he doesn't have the authority whereas when it's his own song you know anything goes but he's very careful and 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 precise i feel when he does uh, even to this day when he does covers yeah, actually, I never finished my my uh, Frank Sinatra review. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So the second one, when he was happier, um, again, it was it was probably just as good, but uh, I didn't prefer. I prefer it when he's when the the sadder songs on the first album, and then the the triplicate. It was just it was just um, you know again uh, more of the same. It was all really good, but I think the the impact of the first one was so strong that it was hard to. Uh, live up to it, but the the uh, and the fa and I know about you think about this, and I haven't thought about this since it came out. But um, supposedly each album had a theme, but I don't know how, if it seemed like every theme had a, an exception <laughs> or something. Maybe the theme was exception. <laughs> yeah, but um. Anyway, yeah. So anyway, I did love I did love it all, and I said live a lot of it was great too, especially um, yeah. that when he was because he was again you know performing live, he really enjoyed. Well, you said you mentioned earlier uh, to tie it back in with rough and rowdy ways. The you know, like the way he sings, uh, "I've made up my mind to give myself to you." That's definitely informed or influenced by the style he adopted to get across the the songs he was singing on those on those uh, Sinatra standards records, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, and also, um, of course, the biggest head he's had in the last few decades is. Um, the song Adele did, um, and Garth Brooks and Billy Joel. Um, oh, uh, thank you too, my life. Yeah, yeah. And um, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying he was trying to replicate that, but um, he, he can't, it's one of those things I don't think he can ignore that his biggest hit, not by him, but that people are covering it. It's, it was number one, like by three different people, I think. And um, uh, well, didn't his office or Dylan, didn't they submit that to? to uh billy joel but the, they, off they offered it to him like hey. yeah, he, he put it out the week before the um i don't know if you ever seen the video he was on uh billy joel went on letterman uh when he was promoting that album and i think it's the only time he even performed it but um they said uh he said um i hope people are still here listening to this <laughs> um they're getting to the good part now <laughs> um the uh, they uh, they had him go to the office and they played it for him. And he they wouldn't allow him to take a recording with him, so he had to learn it and take it with him and and 
he did that. And I think he did a Leonard Cohen song too uh, for that, if I'm not mistaken. And then, because he, he stopped writing songs, realizing that, uh, okay. unlike, unlike a lot of his peers, that people don't want to hear new songs from him. So it just, so he did a couple of covers to fill up a Grace Hits Volume 3. But he also said, um, he said to, when he did talk to Bob Dylan, at some, they happened to both be somewhere. And he said, uh, well, how do you remember, how do you remember all the words? And Dylan said, well, I keep my book of lyrics right here. And he's and, Bob, and Billy said, but yeah, but you can't open up the book and look at the lyrics when you're singing them. And he said, no, it's just good to know they're here. <laughs> but yeah, if you can check out Billy Joel on Letterman in 97, that, that has that interview. It's really good. Yeah, he takes, uh, I could see that though. There's some sort of psychic comfort you take, uh, you know, you take refuge in the in the knowledge that, uh, you know, the book is there to bail you out. I mean, one of my favorite uh, Dylan anecdotes of stories is on the, the 78 tour, which uh, is a great tour, <laughs> underrated. But, uh, you know, Dylan kind of was at a point in his life where he couldn't, uh, he had to be more agreeable because of his financial situation. And the- from Which he hates. <laughs> so the tour started in, uh, in Japan and the Japanese promoters, I guess, faxed him a list of, I don't want to say demands, that's a little harsh, but you know, a list of suggestions like here's some songs we'd sure like you to play right Dylan sent some guy uh to uh to uh you know the shop to to buy a copy of writings and drawings so he could reacquaint himself with his own back catalog <laughs> and that ties back to uh what uh, um got off track before so so with with so i saw him with tom petty and it was a really tight band but he was really particularly inspired when he was doing covers but and so i saw the first film and the dead show which is a story in and of itself but um, it was, you can almost feel the growing pains of Dylan there. It seemed, it felt like he was reemerging into the, what he became with the never ending, never ending tour <clears throat> right after that. Um, and the crowd was kind of, eh, they were kind of lukewarm until, you know, three quarters through the way he started, um, doing, um, uh, slow train. And I don't think it's because it was a hit. It's because it had a dance beat. And then the, the Deadheads could groove to it. And um, so that's one of the songs he actually put on the live album, which people say, why did he put that on there? And also, you know, something with Joey from that show. It's like, why did he put that on there? And it's, I think it's because to him, uh, those were important moments in his, from his perspective, because that's when I got the Deadheads dancing on that. that was the, that's what opened the album. And then uh, Joey's because um, Garcia reintroduced it to him, and he did it. They did it a couple more times, and maybe even better. But it was the first time he did it. So, again, with my crystal clear vision of what Bob Dylan thinks all the time, that's my interpretation. You know, it's interesting. While we're on the subject of the dead and uh, Jerry Garcia, one thing uh, I did notice is, is uh, you know, if we can uh, circle back to uh, one of the. 10,000 disconnected things we spoke about earlier. Uh, one, of those, one of those quotes uh, Dylan supplied to the New Yorker about uh, Leonard Cohen, which I mentioned earlier was uh, uh, that, uh, well, what, what is it? That he, uh, his gift or genius is in his connection to the music of the spheres. And when I read that, I said, where have I heard that before? And sure enough, I pulled up the eulogy, uh, eulogy of sorts that Dylan, uh, uh, wrote uh, or provided to Rolling Stone for Jerry Garcia. And listen to this. He was that great, much more than a superb musician with an uncanny ear and dexterity. He is the very spirit personified of whatever is Muddy River country at its core and screams up into the spheres. So he uses that same imagery to compliment, you know, and going back to what I said earlier, maybe he's saying uh, he is, uh, his music screams up into the spheres. Yep, yep. I, I definitely agree with that one. Um, and uh, again, you know, I can... <laughs> well, it's interesting, you know, okay. one, thing you were, one thing you were saying earlier about, uh, you know, Dylan in the 80s when he was kind of at a low ebb had to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, had to reluctantly uh, uh, take on board uh, people's suggestions or advice or what have you, or, or willingly. There's, a, there's an interview with Arthur Baker who, uh, who, uh, who uh, of course, produced uh, Empire Burlesque. I say, of course, you know, of course. Famous. Of course. You know, and, and Arthur Baker talked about how Dylan basically just wrote the songs, sang the songs and gave them to him and said, do whatever you got to do. You know, I don't know what sells these days, that kind of thing. Whereas that sort of thing, that's unimaginable. Like 
you know, you go back to Blood on the Tracks, you listen to those New York uh, session tapes, you can hear the buttons on his coat click clacking against the guitar. And nobody was, you know, nobody was, uh, excuse me, Bob, uh, could you, you know, nobody even had the, had the, had the courage or the, or, 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 you know, he was such a presence that they couldn't even make a suggestion that, that, uh, that, you know, that timid, but, you know, yeah, I think, I think, I, I, was, you know, signing over the keys of the castle, they, they just do whatever you got to do. I don't know. I think there was, it was a, I think it, it might have been during the Pat Garrett sessions too, but it was also his buttons were clicking or something, and someone mentioned that. Uh, I mean, that's so great. You can just picture yourself in in the in, in the booth, like, oh God, what do we do? What do we do? But, well, the guy. So someone said, uh, hey, "Bob, you yeah, can hear your buttons clicking on the guitar." And he goes, oh, too bad. <laughs> I mean, that's that's not what it's about, you know. It's about whatever he's feeling. The the button. It's, maybe he's trying to you know do percussion at the same time. But. Well, we don't know. I mean, the famous story uh, again. The famous story. You know that his his brother talked him out of uh, you know putting out those uh, you know those those recordings and you know, you know giving him a little more energy or whatever. Maybe his brother brought up the buttons. We don't know. He didn't. Maybe he brought up the buttons. We don't know. Maybe the buttons was <laughs> was it was a deal breaker. <laughs> and maybe Bob was ravaged with. Why didn't anybody tell me? Why didn't anybody tell me? You put crickers on my albums, Daniel Lanois. Why do we can put buttons on my records? It was a test. It was a test of the studio musicians, uh, and, and or the studio uh, engineers. But um, and the other thing is, uh, so uh, you know, so I didn't really get into Dylan until the seventies. I knew I knew he was in the sixties, but I didn't. Get, I just thought I liked the Beatles and the Monkees, and you know, went from AM radio. And uh, I had a friend who got me really into Dylan. He he was like. He was he was already convert like way before I was, and then he got me tickets to see him. So I saw him with the, Dylan and the band, and then I got Rolling Thunder Review. So that's that was my like, oh my god, I can't believe this guy exists. So when I saw him in '78, there was this shock of, oh my god, what the what the hell? I mean, it was like flutes. I mean, it was just like, you know, what, what's he doing with these? He's like, you know, I think it's the thing about you know playing Japan. It's like I'll do these songs, and I guess Rob Stoner. Um, uh, is taking a lot of credit in interviews about uh, a lot of the arrangements. And at the time I thought, oh my God, what, what, it, it, and I, I wouldn't say I, that it was terrible. It's just, I said, I didn't get it. And now I look back on it and I absolutely love it. I love the flutes. I love the fact oh. that it, it was even more daring than the stuff he was doing with Dylan and the band and Dylan and the Rolling Thunder Review, because that was what you would more, what you would expect or hope. And this is the, again, it was, it was similar to, uh, what the folkies must have felt because it was just this isn't rock and roll this is Vegas yeah. or the, yeah. no it's it's interesting you mentioned that because uh, this is a matter about which I, I've thought about a great deal <laughs> and I, it, the seventy eight but I think I think perhaps it's a luxury we have uh, you know at this moment in time is that you can look back on tours like that and appreciate them as as chapters in the story whereas at the time i can sympathize with people like who are you know you don't know what's you know you know is bob going to be beholden to the flute from here on out you know like you don't know whether he's going to be captured same thing with the with the uh, you know the, uh, the 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 you know the gospel records or if you want to call them that mm -hmm. I, usually I do <laughs> but I, at the time, i'd be like okay you know same thing with the standards records like okay you know this was nice this was nice and then the third one comes around you're like oh this, this is where we are so that is a lesson that you know, time you know provides us all is the ability to appreciate them as as you know parts of the whole rather than fret about you know is this indicative of some larger trend that's gonna you know dwarf everything before me. Yeah, I mean, that, <clears throat> that was when, yeah. Um, yeah, anything he does, you figure, well, he's not going to be doing it for long, that particular way, that particular thing. Um, all right, well, this is this is getting to be longer than Ronaldo and Clara here. <laughs> Can we take uh, an intermission? <laughs> allow the people to regroup. I, I, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, when, when Ronaldo and I, I was in Boston and I went down to New York to see it uh, during vacation or whatever it was and it was in the snow i went to see it and i don't even they're supposed to have an intermission i didn't even think they bothered <laughs> but um anyway so anyway Harry, you know, what I, say is I was really disappointed 
that um, you know they put out that omnibus box set of the um, you know Rolling Thunder seventy five at least seventy five live recordings and they didn't mm -hmm. have uh, a sad eyed lady of the lowlands from Ronaldo and Clara. Which that is that summarizes Bob Dylan in a nutshell <laughs> because I it's like um, he's got to leave something out first. Of, I mean, you think perhaps, you think it was conscious, or they lost the tapes, or it was. Uh, I can't, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm sort of, you know, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but it's like I remember when I saw Dylan in the band. It's like I can't wait. Like the thing that the, like I barely knew the songs. Like it might have been the first time I even heard like a Rolling Stone knowingly that night. I mean, when I saw him in '74. Um, but the the song that blew me away the most was "Ballad of Harlots Brown" because I didn't even know, know the title. I mean, some of the songs. Like I knew he's gonna open with most likely you go your way, you go mine. So I read the village voice and it said that's what he opened with and that's what he closed with. It's like, okay. Um and uh okay, so I know it's on blonde on blonde, and that was probably the first time I heard I know that was the first time I ever heard that. But um it's like Ballad of Hollis Brown. It's like it was like Robbie was like Hendrix. It was like it was just this really amazing thing that I didn't even know existed. And I couldn't wait to buy before the flood and I get it. And it's like, well, where is it? <laughs> you know, and uh, so I said, oh, I guess getting, being disappointed by these things is always gonna happen. And of course, you, you know, we can go on and on about uh, Infidels and all these other albums where, you know, it's a shot of love and uh, songs he left out and the whole gospel period where there was easily another, possibly the best gospel album could have been released if they took, you know, 10 of those songs that he didn't put out and made an album out of it, but. It yeah, I mean, the best explanation I ever heard of that, uh, of, uh, you know, Dylan's tendency to leave the, you know, the school on the cutting room floor is, is, and I wish I, I could, I could say who said this, but I almost feel bad saying it without crediting them, but it was just, you know, it was a person on, on, I think the Steve Hoffman forums, the, the idea being that like Dylan, uh, judges songs not on merit versus merit, but based on degree of realization. Ah. So that a song with a lower ceiling that he feels was, was, um, uh, you know, was fully realized, he'll include over a song that had greater potential, but which he didn't, which he feels he didn't, you know, fulfill. Like, you know, um, Blind William McTell and songs like that, where mm -hmm. people scratch their heads and saying, really, he, it was supposed to be better than that? <laughs> but, oh, well, uh, that's, that's one of the unusual cases where, you know, the band brought it out and Dylan was, okay, you've convinced me, you know, and then he started playing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, um, Harry, uh, this has been a pleasure. I'm looking at the, uh, it's probably, uh, like it's almost an hour and a half, I think. <laughs> Longer than blood. It's about as long no, as man, blood. I got a lot more notes of ever know. <laughs> Is there anything we didn't cover you wanted to cover? Oh, I don't know. I feel like I, I've only really got about 50 thoughts, and I feel like I, 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 you know, just in life, I've got about 50 thoughts, and I feel like I expressed about 45 of them here. So I'll keep the other five for, uh, for a future appearance, you know. If the people demand it, you know, it's, like, mm. it's up to the, it's up to the uh, listeners. Well, how about for an encore, just like, uh, just, uh, uh, I just thought of this too, but um, just your thoughts on the, on the symposium. We'll, we'll, we'll bring it full circle and, um, and um, what you thought about it. And uh, well, last year's I thought was incredible. I mean, and uh, just what they were able to do. I mean, nobody really knew what to expect going in. I think, uh, you know, including, you know, I think they, they got far more people than they, 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 you know, had bargained for and, uh, you know, they handled it impeccably. So I'll be really interested to see what happens. Uh, I mean, I have to think, uh, I, you probably know more about this than me, but uh, whether, you know, how, you know, everything that's going on has impacted the timeline in terms of when everything's going to be operational. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, Hopefully, hopefully it, the uh, Bob Dylan archive becomes so popular that uh, we get uh, direct flights to uh, Tulsa at some point. <laughs> um, I, there's uh, this guy um, I'm friends with on Facebook. I think his name is I think Bruce Slutsky, is, I think is his name. And he just had some sort of Zoom meeting and Sean Latham was uh, part of it. And he said next time they're expecting like a thousand people instead of 500. And um, I guess everything's still kind of on for next fall, oh, yeah. but um, at least for now. Um, but I wasn't part of it, and I, it's one of those things, like one of the many bits of things that pass by my social media screens, and I kind of half remember them. But something well, along those lines. I will say, I will 
will say one thing uh, to get my 46 uh, thought out of the way here. <laughs> there is a uh, there's a Leonard Cohen archive that's uh, housed inside the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library at the University of Toronto. Oh, I've been up there, and there's there's a tranche of letters that is that uh, that's that's sealed. Because, uh, you know, Cohen's instructions were that it, it was to remain sealed until the deaths of the correspondents. Mm -hmm. And which I'll share with you and uh, and uh, select few uh, others is that uh, it anyone to, to reward anyone who made it all the way to the end. Of the far, is that a, evidently word on the street is that includes several letters to and from Bob Dylan, which Ooh. I can neither confirm nor deny. But, uh, Nor are we necessarily looking forward to seeing, because that sad day will not be. Well, I I plan to avoid that that uh, that uh, sadness by dying uh, well before Bob Dylan. Oh no, no no. I had no no. I'm sorry, you can't talk me out of it. Uh, well, I, I mean, I'm not saying I you know that I I I'm fully expecting Dylan to live at least to you know 150 or 60. So. All right. Got All right. Yeah, I don't want to. I didn't want to end on a bummer here. <laughs> I feel, you know, we've driven this in, we've driven the hearts of fire bus into a ditch. <laughs> but, but, so to summarize. Uh, summarize, in summation. Everything Bob Dylan does is awesome on one level or another. And uh, we, we just try to figure it out and, and it, it, you know, try to figure him out and it helps us figure us, ourselves out. Very well said. I, 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 best of luck with the, uh, I don't know when this is going to air or, uh, if it's going to air, if people have the, or if people, God love them, have the patience to make it this far, but it, best They're of all luck in quarantine. With, what else are they going to do? <laughs> best of luck with the uh, video podcast. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, everything you do. Oh, big thank you. And likewise. All right. Um, do you anything you want to so say? So bye, Harry. Anything anybody out there would like to say to us or if they, they can't hear us? <laughs> You're already yelling at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right well thanks harry i this was very very enjoyable even better than i thought it was going to be and um and i thought it was going to be pretty awesome because uh i enjoyed talking to you back in tulsa and uh enjoy following you on twitter um the uh web page that this will be uh associated with will have uh links to um that uh desolation row and if you don't mind the uh uh the grateful dead cover podcast and um your Twitter feed and if anyone wants to find out more about you. All right. Terrific. Well, nice talking to you. Let's do this again sometime. Yeah. Well, yeah, we have so much we haven't covered. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we'll keep on keeping on. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye everybody. Uh, so are you still there? I'm still here. What do we do?